So we'll move on to the next topic, which has to do with hip trauma. Let me get this out of the way here. Not sure why this is projecting this way. Just having. Okay. All right. So, uh, right. Okay. So, uh, so we're talking about hip trauma. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Um, I mean, there's a, like severe dysplasia, abnormality of the proximal, I mean, of all the bones, but especially involving the femurs bilaterally. Um, I don't know if this is like some severe form of OI. So, so when you see discombobulated joints, what is the first thing you think about? Um. Well, the first thing I always think about when I think is just a bunch of chronic fractures in the setting of OI, but if it's not that, in terms of what? Uh, like uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. Yeah, uh, but, but the spine looks pretty good. It does. It's, it's just kind of the hips and the pelvic uh, Get closer to the mic, John. Well, now I'm having trouble with the sound here. Just a second, John. Let me see if I can figure out how to get the sound to work properly. John, would you talk again? I got closer to the mic. Okay, so I got this square here. You got it now. Okay, so... Uh, but, 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 so, so when you see really joints like this, you could certainly think of osteogenesis imperfecta, but there's a lot of the bone here that looks pretty normal. But when you see joints that, that are completely kind of destroyed, uh, one of the things you think about is uh, uh, chronic repetitive trauma and, and neuropathic joints, right? So thinking about that, what do you see? I mean, if you look at like this, the sacrum, so they're going to have some, uh, some sort of spinal cord, uh, you know, abnormality of uh, spina bifida. Well, I don't see spina bifida, so yeah, but you, you, have, you have sacral agenesis here, right? And uh, so uh, this patient was paraplegic from birth, and this is Charcot disease involving the hips. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's talk about trauma. Now, uh, uh, well, I can talk about transient, transient bone marrow edema. In the old days, this was called, taught, called transient uh, osteonecrosis of the hips. Uh, uh, with MR, we've really changed uh, this diagnosis uh, pr from being uh, an osteonecrosis to really being a trabecular bone injury pattern. Uh, we'll talk about uh, you know other forms of occult trabecular fracture, cortical fracture, and fecial injury. So, but first, if we just look at the joints, uh, there are a couple of things on plain films that you've, you were all taught to look at in, in trading. Uh, you can look at the, the superior joint here should be between three and seven millimeters. The medial joint space is typically around 11 millimeters. Uh, you, you look for the, the teardrop sign uh, and, uh, 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 and then here's the, uh, the joint space. Uh, there's a medial joint space area, there's the teardrop, uh, and then you look at Kohler's line, run through here, uh, and, then, and then here the SI joints should be around two to four millimeters, and then the symphysis pubis should be less than five millimeters, sort of basic things to, to look at. Okay, all right. Oh, this is kind of a review. Okay. Uh, so I'll call on her next. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of marrow edema of the uh, left hip. There's some some degenerative change, but 
Not crazy amount. Okay. Uh, it's low T1 signal of the central femoral head, I, th oh, I think. Um, yeah. Posteriorly. Yeah, posteriorly. It, does, it looks like focal low signal there, posterior femoral head. Uh, so, so uh, well, what's your diagnosis? Um, can you can you get like a transient transient osteoporosis or? So what is transient osteoporosis? Um, well, it's just marrow edema, basically, right? Or no, no. transient oh. osteoporosis is a plate tilt, not an MR diagnosis. Okay. So what do you see on a plate tilt? Uh, well, you you just see um, less dense bone. You see osteopenia. Yeah. So, so typically, right away, uh, the hips are fairly pretty symmetric, but within a week to ten days, what you'll see in the symptomatic size, you'll see decreased density within the the femoral head, and then uh, and it's usually very painful at that stage, and then typically by about three months. Uh, it will go back to normal again, and the, the pain will gradually go away. And we used to call that transient osteoporosis. And there's kind of debate as to what that was due to. Uh, so w when MR came on the scene, and we started seeing patients who had classic uh, transient osteoporosis on x-rays, what did it look like on an MR? Um, it looks like trabecular bone marrow, or trabecular so, injury. So with MR, what we saw was bone marrow edema, kind of diffuse, very similar to this. This is actually an, an old, this is an old case back in the early days of MR. And so instead of calling osteoporosis, since we couldn't really see the density well by MR directly, uh, we, we called it transient bone marrow edema syndrome. And uh, in, in in the old days, most people believed that transient osteoporosis was a form of avascular necrosis. It was thought that it was a, a uh, ischemic lesion of the bone, and, and that's really why it hurt. But by, by MR, what we found is that uh, very few of these patients ever went to a double line sign. And if treated conservatively without weight bearing, it almost always uh, went back to normal. And as the bone marrow edema went away, the, p the pain went away. And so now we really recognize this as a, a trabecular bone injury pattern. It can either be due to uh, increased stress on relatively normal bone, or more commonly what it is, it's, it's people who have weakened bone and normal stresses end up fracturing the trabecular bone. And the reason it's so painful uh, is that it, it's basically a, a fracture. A, and just like the most painful part of uh, avascular necrosis is the, the Sternberg stage three, where you get those subchondral fractures, uh, that, that's really what uh, is now believed to be happening in this particular case. So now it's typically called transient bone marrow edema syndrome, or, or just uh, uh, subchondral uh, trabecular injury. John, do you want to comment? Um, from Campbell's um, the latest edition, um, and, and with my experience in the past, it, it, uh, this condition started um, uh, being noticed in pregnant women, and it was unilateral. Uh, once the pregnancy was over, the condition stopped. And uh, then it was picked up on men in the middle age, um, and uh, the pain was extremely severe. I I took care of my mentor uh, in sports medicine at UCLA. Uh, I brought him to another hospital, and uh, I had to give him morphine IV for a couple of days and crutches. And um, he got well soon. He was a pretty tough guy. And, um, and all we saw was osteoporosis. This was before MRI. Um, and uh, most of the um, reason for this condition, uh, what causes it is really unknown. Uh, now, there are certain...
John, we lost you. What, what looks like a subchondral fracture line, but it, it doesn't usually turn out to be a fracture because that line disappears and uh, nothing happens thereafter. The pain just goes away. Almost always within six months. I have, I have a, I have a problem. I uh, uh, right now. So, um, but it is a transient condition. Uh, should never operate on it. And uh, crutches do the trick. And without it, I would have never known it. Yeah, John, uh, you're you're fading out. Uh, but you have a you, you have a connection problem. The diagnosis is made with edema. That's it. Yeah, John, we we can't hear you very well. Sure. Uh, but what we now know with this condition, is far. it is microfractures of the trabecular bone. Uh, that's what it is. It's not unknown anymore. And uh, if, if it's allowed to heal, John, you're having a problem that's, uh, that's causing a lot of feedback on the system. John, I'm having trouble. Yeah. John, you're having a connection problem. Uh, if, if it's a... the most painful. John, John, we, we can't hear you anymore. You need to oh. sign off and sign back on again. And it's due to... J John, it's... you have to sign off and sign back on again. It's, it's your, your system's not working properly. For some reason, this problem here. John, your your system's not working. So so this this is a fracture of the bone. If the bone is protected to allow it to heal, John, John you have to. Have to Are you having on your? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if the, the important thing on this, and I'll show cases in a minute, is not to not to make the diagnosis of avascular necrosis right away, and I'll explain why and show some cases why, uh, because uh, uh, as we go forward. Uh, th this, if it's allowed to heal, this will heal and will not require surgery or hip replacement. Uh, many of these, however, uh, in the past have been have been basically treated with hip replacement, and uh, and that's really generally not necessary, except for very few cases. If you have a collapse of the of the subchondral bone uh, because you continue to weight bear on injured trabecular bone. Uh, then that may go on to degenerative disease requiring a hip replacement. But if you protect it, uh, it can heal. Okay, Jennifer, uh, what do you think of this case? Um, okay, so here we have some, it looks like coronal. Hi, John, you rejoined us. Um, thank, thank you. It's been a struggle. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead. The coronal images of the bilateral hips, and there is some diminished signal intensity within that left femoral head and neck junction. I, I think that's probably some marrow edema within the left femoral head and neck junction. This is a T1. This is a STIR sequence. Okay, so here on the STIR images, we can see extensive marrow edema throughout the left femoral head, extending to the femoral head and neck junction. Uh, here we have some sagittal images of diffuse marrow edema. I don't see any evidence of subchondral fracture or collapse. Yeah. Um, so. 
little bit concerned right in through here. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. There's minimal there. Uh, three months later, the patient was asymptomatic and the MR scan was normal. And this again is transient edema syndrome, uh, uh, which we see here. Um, talking about right in here? Yeah. yeah, and there's also a little irregularity over here. Yeah, yeah but uh, uh, but the, this is a little different than the last one, and this is an important difference, is that the immediate subchondrobone, except for over here near the fovea, on the primary weight-bearing surface up here, the subchondrobone is relatively normal in signal, uh, though it is a little bit different from the other side. Uh, <clears throat> And most of the marrow edema is a little bit away from the subchondral bone, uh, which means this patient is at a little bit less risk for collapse than if the marrow uh, edema went all the way to the bone. And here we can see there's a little bit of uh, space there. Okay. All right. Uh, Michael. New onset right hip pain. Um, kind of similar to the one that Jennifer just took. There's areas of kind of patchy, low, or hypo-intense signal on the T1 coronal, which correlates to markedly hyper-intense signal on the STIR image. So again, and yeah, I don't see a discrete fracture or displacement. So again, you're thinking of the transient bone marrow edema. Six months later, the signal is now symmetric, and there's maybe minimal uh, edema there as well. But there's also a little bit of that similar signal on the left. So then, again, this is uh, uh, what's now typical of transient marrow edema syndrome. Okay. Uh, and here's this. So if you have a bone scan in these patients, it's very hot. Here's a T1-weighted image, very early studies. Uh, now, this was a 43-year-old male physician's assistant who had pip, hip pain two weeks after exercising. This was on 9-21-2010. What do you think of this case? Um, looks like extensive marrow edema throughout the, uh, the right femoral head, extending up to the subchondral bone um, and, and into the femoral neck as well. There's some more studies. Yep. Now, a month later, they got another MR scan at this point, and the patient was even, it was even more painful at this time. Yep. Um, yeah, it looks a little worse, I think, in terms of the marrow edema, especially along the medial femoral uh, head and superior femoral head. It almost looks like there might be a, a deficiency. Uh, yeah, right there, a low signal line on the T1s and bright, a little bit brighter on the T2s there. And I'd be worried about some early subchondral um, collapse. Okay. Uh, this was called avascular necrosis, and it was recommended that he have hip replacement for this. Uh, he then uh, uh, oh. saw me, and we had a different discussion about it. John, go ahead. I, I definitely would not recommend a hip replacement in this case. Uh, what are you going to replace? The, the joint space looks good. Uh, it, it makes no sense to replace the hip. Well, the crutches maybe for a few days to relieve this pain. Maybe some anti-inflammatory medication, but that's definitely not a hip replacement. Good. Um, but, but a hip yeah. replacement is what he had from two surgeons, one of which was a well-known surgeon in Santa Monica. And uh, this is what the scan showed on 10-17-2010. Uh, so, so we talked about it, and he decided not to have surgery at that time. And the discussion was, well, even if it goes for the collapse, can always have hip surgery later, but you can't undo hip surgery once you have it. So he decided that, that he would take his chance and not have surgery. And then he came back uh, January 4, 2011, so two months later. Here you can see most of the Mario edema actually has resolved within the femoral head, but there is, a, there is a, some low signal still remaining along the superior margin of the femoral head um, with some low... T1 signal um, and some increased T2 signal right there. Um, I, it, it looks like it's 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 healing, but I'm like wait, wait for a few more months. And he was markedly better at this point. And uh, so before, this is what the sagittal images looked at that time. And again, we see that little area of subchondral edema that's still there. And then 
he was doing he was even better in March and this is what it looks like uh, it looks a little bit better um, I still see that persistent subchondral edema of the femoral head here um, although on the sagittals it doesn't look bad at all uh, it looks much better it's a little irregular yeah remember something uh, every time you look at uh, films you don't operate on on uh, mris or x-rays you operate on people and you go by symptoms uh, if somebody's getting better leave them alone and let them continue to heal uh, this obviously was a transient edema case and uh, it would have been uh, in my opinion, malpractice to operate on this case. Well, we didn't, and he was feeling much better by this time. And then we kept following him since he was a physician assistant, and we were interested in uh, the course of the disease. By July, he was almost asymptomatic, and we can see uh, just a little bit of residual uh, edema in the subchondral bone there. He started exercising again uh, at this time, still a little bit of subchondral abnormality. Uh, but he had continued decrease in symptoms, and finally he called me up uh, 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 almost a year later asking if uh, I'd like to him to come by and have another MR scan just to see what it looked like, and this is what it looked like now in March of 2012. Uh, I think even though there is a little bit of irregularity of the subchondral bone, I think the edema has resolved. I think that's just... Uh, that's just a fovea area, isn't it? No, no, it's Sorry, it's not the fovea. Fovea is more, more. Yeah, and, and at this time he was back doing full uh, sports activities and was completely asymptomatic. So uh, I, I just want to point out uh, th there was a, a, a time before MR scan where it was believed that all of these situations were actually ischemic disease, and uh, they there is the tendency to call them avascular necrosis. The problem with making the diagnosis of avascular necrosis is one, this isn't an ischemic lesion, so it's just not correct. And, and number two, uh, there's a knee-jerk thought that if you have avascular necrosis, it needs to go on to hip replacement, and uh, uh, that's not appropriate for these people who have the transient bone marrow edema syndrome. Uh, John? Uh, well, one, one thing uh, is that uh, in my situation, I I thought I had AVN and uh, never showed it on MRI, never showed it on CT, um, never showed it at all, but uh, my brother died, and, uh, and that, that before then I had that injection of uh, cortisone that I talked about the other day, and, and and that really got my hip painful in pain. But I got so tired of pain after about a year or two that I decided to go ahead and have a hip replacement, uh, which has been good to me since. Yeah, good. But, uh, whether I needed it or not, I'm not sure even to this day. Well, how old were you when you got the hip replacement? 70. Yeah, see, and that, so th that'll last you the rest of your life. This other guy who we were just talking to was in his 30s. Yeah, and th that's what I figured, and uh, uh, that, 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 that would have been a, a disastrous situation, frankly. So here's a paper we published in the journal Radiology back in 1995. We, we evaluated 70 patients who presented with high clinical suspicion of hip fracture who all had negative x-rays, and we performed an MR scan uh, back in the late 80s, early 1990s. And uh, what we found, oops, I've got to get something out of the way here. Sorry, guys. Well, what we found of these, uh, uh, 37% had classic findings on an MR scan of femoral fracture. A few of those were uh, confirmed by CT, but most of them we just made the diagnosis confidently by, by looking at MRI. 23% didn't have femoral fractures, but had pelvic fractures. 61% uh, had soft tissue edema, 
a lot of those with soft tissue edema also had fractures, and the edema was probably hemorrhage from the fracture. Only 3% had AVN uh, on MR with double line sign, and 4% uh, had uh, trochanteric fluid, so really had a uh, what we called in those days a trochanteric bursitis. Uh, now we really uh, talk about that as being tendinopathy of the gluteus tendons, which we'll talk about. And what, what we found is with negative x-rays, we could make what we were confident was a definitive diagnosis 80% of the time uh, on an MR examination. So our recommendation at that time was if you're concerned about uh, x-ray negative injuries to the bone, you really should do an MR scan. Uh, this was in the early days when it wasn't so, it was not at all recognized that MR could evaluate bone disease. In fact, it was generally felt at that time that MR was not a technique that could evaluate bone. So let's go on and talk about uh, kind of other fractures, femoral neck fractures, both incomplete and complete, intertrochanteric fractures, some other, and some other kinds of fractures. Yes, quick question. Uh, for the fractures that you mentioned, the femoral and pelvic fractures, is that including trabecular contusion? Would you group that into a fracture as well, or yes. micro? Okay. Uh, uh, Jennifer, oh, this is a polytomogram. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these. Uh, this is what you did back before CT was around, uh, where you would take, you'd move the film and the the X-ray tube at the same time when you took a a uh, 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 when you acquired data on a film, and what happened, it would blur out everything front and back of the plane, uh, 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 one plane, and this was a way to actually get higher resolution in one plane, but blurring out areas on, others, on either side. So it was a very low quality, basically, CT scan uh, back in those days. Uh, <clears throat> But it was a little bit more sensitive for looking at fractures than just train straight projection radiography. So this was somebody who came in with one of these patients that we just talked about. X-rays were negative, so we did this uh, uh, this particular study, uh, and it, it really we don't see any fracture. We can see nice normal trabecular bone, a subchondral bone. So uh, Jennifer, what do you think we did next? Um, at this time, did you have CT scan? The, we did have CT scan. It was not a not not a great quality CT scan, but we did have CT scan. Okay, so either a CT or an I would prefer an MRI if you had it. Okay, and this was in the early days of MR as well. This is what the T1 weighted MR scan looked like of that patient. Okay, so there is low signal intensity at the inferior aspect of the femoral head, kind of in the, just above the greater trochanter, extending through the femoral neck. It looks like this could be a non-displaced fracture. So, so that this is an incomplete fracture uh, here in the femoral neck. That's right. Okay. okay. Michael. So there's... I don't want to do anything with it. Jennifer? Um, I don't think that patient needs surgery. I think they probably need to limit their weight bearing. Um, and I would think conservative treatment would be best. I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, the, the, the only thing is I'd be a lot happier if it was a superior neck, not the inferior neck because the stresses are on the inferior neck. Uh, I would definitely put this patient on crutches and uh, follow closely for a period of time. Uh, I've treated many, many cases uh, with the inferior, with superior neck fractures that are impacted and uh, never operated on them and they got uh, uh, to heal and uh, had no problems. Uh, so, non-surgical treatment of neck, neck fractures, in my opinion, is quite acceptable. Uh, other doctors will disagree with me, but I'm not that hungry for surgery, or I never used to be. 
um, that I would operate just just for my own uh, security. Uh, it, it used to work out. You'd have a good discussion with the patient to be careful, et cetera. They would heal, and, and it's amazing how that would happen. I never had a single one fall apart out of a couple hundred cases. Yeah, uh, That's the way this patient was treated, though in my experience over the years, when you have incomplete fractures through the neck like this, uh, my experience, John, has been that most orthopedic surgeons will put two, two or three nails in these, and they claim that they can be weight-bearing immediately with that, and that the patients have less symptoms and do better if they uh, 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 do that. What's your the point? inferior neck, like I said, uh, is of a concern uh, to me, but this is seems stable. Obviously, it needs a, a good examination and see how much stress you can put on, on, on the hip um, before the patient screams. Um, if, if they can tolerate um, that kind of stress, then uh, I, I wouldn't operate. If, if they were having a lot of pain, then I would. Okay. Uh, yeah. One has to remember that getting in and out of bed uh, you're putting double uh, the amount of weight on the patient's hip uh, uh, that you would when you're standing. Okay. Uh, so so it, it, there's a lot of stress on the hip when you're getting in and out of bed, et cetera. Um, just because you're at bed rest doesn't mean that you're uh, safe. Okay. Uh, so here's the patient's right hip pain. Uh, and left hip pain. Okay. Um, cause it looks like they've got like bilateral foreshortening of their femoral necks and chronic it's just, it's just positioning. Okay. Um, well, I mean, they, uh, cause their femoral heads look abnormal. Like there's been bony remodeling. Oh, now it looks normal or I mean, normal-ish the femoral heads. There's a subcapital non-displaced transverse, uh, femoral neck fracture though. And this is a tomography, isn't it, John? No, I think this is just a come down frog leg view. It looks like the old tomography. I, I, I use quite a few of them. Yeah, well, maybe the, the, the one before was an old tomography image. Yeah, so you can see the trabecular. But, but I think that's primarily because they have osteoporosis. Can, can we go back to that first image? Because I've never seen that. It's quite a contraption. Uh, it must be in a museum someplace where you can take a look at it. Yeah. Okay, so here's what the MR. MR, we can kind of see what we saw on the plane film. There's a somewhat linear hypo intensity on the T1 at the kind of subcapital. But here on the plane film, that is very linear. Yeah. It's a little more serpiginous. I'm not sure if this one's complete, but it's involving the medial aspect. And so now on the stir image, we see a lot of edema along the medial aspect. You're thinking like an incomplete, high-grade incomplete stress fracture. So that's, a, that's another an incomplete fracture, primarily involving the trabecular bone, though there might be a little bit of extension to the cortex here. Okay. Forty-one-year-old female with osteomalacia, TNZ score negative four point six. Okay. Um, there's irregularities of that inferior pubic rami bilaterally. I don't know if there's a previous remote fracture deformities there. Um, the no, John, excuse me. Uh, no, no, what happened? That thing. We just. Uh, I'm sorry. John, you're breaking up again. Do you happen to know what happened to that patient? To this patient? This patient? No, the prior patient. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, no, I do not know what happened to this patient. It probably got operated on it. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. 
Yeah. Yeah. If I'm wrong, neck on the right look a little bit irregular. I don't know if I can follow the trabecular lines there. Yeah, it looks, it looks like there might be some. Uh, very clearly here, there's marrow edema kind of bilaterally, and there's irregularities both through both femoral head neck junction, subcapital, incomplete fractures here. And um, you know, we're looking at the psoas muscle on the left side. Is there hemorrhage or is this an abscess right there? Yeah. Oh, no, this is. Yeah. T1. Okay, so it's this right. Is a deep fat set. Deep fat set. Okay. So, um, I guess it, it, there's there's definitely fluid along so the posterior. Bilateral incomplete fractures. As you all must be. Uh, the only thought of that here. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer, uh, right hip pain. So here we have a coronal T1 image of the bilateral hips, and it looks like there is some low signal intensity in the right inferior aspect of the intratrochanteric region. I would be concerned about an incomplete fracture. Okay, so there here we have, I think these are T2 or PDFS images, and they're surrounding edema along the infer aspect of the fracture plane and some cortical irregularity. Um, I don't see any definite extension superiorly, but I think this is again concerning for an, a stress fracture or incomplete fracture. Yeah, rather on what's called the calcar, that medial margin of the uh, neck. Uh, and uh, typically people call these stress fractures. The low signal here is compressed trabecular bone where you have compression of the trabecula. Then you have surrounding trabecular injury with edema and hemorrhage uh, in those particular areas. And it can start here uh, <clears throat> due to compression of the bone, typically in patients with uh, osteomalacia. And then it can uh, extend across until you get a complete fracture if, if you, know, you don't do anything to help change the course. Okay, Michael. Rule out hip fracture after fall. Um, so this is a, a bone scan. So first see radio tracer uptake in the lower lumbar spine, kind of probably right at the lumbosacral junction. And then maybe, I'm not sure if that's real, the uptake at the bilateral sacroiliac joints. Um, the actual, I don't, is that, some mild patchy signal right at like the like the joint. I'm not sure if that's real or not. Um, and then okay, so the right femur. That's not, we're not getting some weird angle like angle right. That's pathology. So they've got a like it looks like an intertrochanteric fracture with edema. No 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 no. That's not an intertrochanteric fracture. That's low, that base of the neck fracture. Yeah, sorry, yeah, base. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's complete. Um, and then there's a little bit of signal on the left that you'd circled as well. Okay. Yeah, so, so. And I don't really see it. Can we go back to the bone scan? Uh -huh. Uh, th this we 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 really thought that bone scan was very sensitive back when we first started doing MR scans. So we tried to do studies using bone scan as the uh, gold standard. But what we r rapidly found is that early on, within about two or three days after the event, the bone scan is routinely negative. So so MR turned out to be much more sensitive than bone scanning. So we had to not use the bone scan as the gold standard. And I know in like early elderly patients, it can be negative for uh, I, I used to think of it as copper, John. Copper? What do you mean copper, John? Uh, I didn't think that the uh, bone scan was a gold standard. Oh, copper scanner, right, gotcha. All right, that's what it turned out to be. You're absolutely right. 
and we, we just don't do those for fractures anymore, but bone scan was a commonly used for fractures back before the MR days. I remember, but in our part of the woods, we, we didn't go for it that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, here on the T1 images, you can see um, a minimally displaced, incom it's incomplete though, fracture in the uh, superior subcapital region of the right femoral head neck junction. It might go all the way through actually. And there is some inferior angulation, some v almost vera, vera, uh, co uh, coxa vera deformity. So, so what would you do in this case? Um, uh, this, if it's complete, I, I think you'd have to maybe pin this. Um, and it's complete. Well, yeah. you said pin. Um, it depends on the age. If this patient is over 65, I wouldn't pin it. I would put in a prosthesis. Uh, the reason being is pinning this uh, it puts a lot of stress on that fracture site, including, of course, uh, the, the instrument that you use to pin it with. I used to like a Ken nail. It's a sliding nail with um, three flanges on it. And it, it always did me very good. Uh, it failed one time. I had to go back and tighten it. And that was in a uh, appeal score judge's mother. That was kind of, well, he took me fishing afterwards and we became friends, but that's okay. Uh, anyway, um, and this is a, a case where you have to make a decision on the basis of the age of the patient. Because if you put in a prosthesis, especially a, a by a, um, bipolar prosthesis where it slides on each other, uh, in, in, in two different directions if you need to. Um, and the patient does very well and gets up the same uh, day or the, the day after and starts walking. If you pin it with, with, a, with a nail uh, or uh, pins, uh, this patient won't walk for six months. So uh, it all depends on age. Yeah, and my experience with these fractures that are on the lateral side like this, if you can see this is unstable, the head is actually shifted. See, the cortex has shifted here. So this is really not a stable fracture. And it goes right at the base, uh, the vascularity comes from the neck. Uh, my experience with a few of these that I've seen that they tried to preserve is that they all ended up going into necrosis and having to to have uh, well, once they go into varus, you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, this uh, this head is not. Uh, some people did CT scans uh, to see a vascularity, um, and um, if if it was black, uh, they would go ahead and remove the head and and then replace it with the prosthesis. If if it had vascularity, they would pin it. But uh, 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 to me, that made no sense. Okay. Uh, just another procedure. Great. Okay, Jennifer, 64-year-old female. Okay, so here we can see abnormal linear decreased T1 signal along the left femoral neck with diffuse surrounding edema compatible with a mildly displaced and impacted fracture um, and there's surrounding soft tissue edema and intramuscular edema along the iliopsoas and gluteal muscles. Um, and here we can see probably uh, the fracture again, the displaced and impacted fracture. It looks like there may be a little bit of anterior angulation and impaction. Um, so that's a subcapital fracture. Uh, is, uh, is impaction good? No. Well, it's, well let me tell you, it's, it's, it's as good as pinning the, the hip just about. 
I treated many of these cases that are impacted and they worked out just fine. So uh, uh, do you, you still need to pin this? Yeah, imp in impaction can substitute for pinning. Uh, I, I, like I said, I treated several hundred of these uh, that way and, and uh, never had to operate on one. So, so this has a much better prognosis than this. This you can see is distracted. Uh, this one is actually impacted. And the impacted yeah, this one I would leave alone and uh, have a nice talk with the lady and tell her to take it easy. You have to remember, 64, you can always put in a prosthesis uh, if it uh, displaces. And uh, you can repin it if you wish, but that would be nonsensical. So, uh, no reason to operate. As you said before, a lot of it depends upon the symptoms. And they, they may, uh, uh, if they have to have bed rest, that can be bad for people who are older. So, there are a lot of things that have to be taken into account to decide whether you want to put in a prosthesis or not. Our, our um, procedure in, in Santa Monica, St. John's, and, and Santa Monica Hospitals was the sooner you operate, the better. Uh, we used to operate at night uh, it, 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 once the schedule was clear. Uh, we didn't wait till the next day um, because you get dehydration, et cetera, and electrolyte imbalance, and the patient goes goofy, and then they're hard to take care of. Um, so we used to operate as soon as possible. Uh, patient walking is in the can complaining of a groin pull. Okay, so we have a mildly displaced kind of distracted basal cervical uh, femoral neck fracture. Um, and it's kind of angulated as well, kind of in like coxa verga. What would you do with this one? Um, so this looks in now on the Axial image, you can see that it's anterior angulated well and pretty distracted in its place. This one you'd have to, uh, I don't know if you just could put in a prosthesis or try to pin it. Yeah, you can You can put in a prosthesis in this case, especially if the age is right. Uh, you could also pin it, but pinning uh, this this one is not as stable and, and, and as a uh, happy result as uh, putting in a prosthesis. Uh, I, I sleep better if I put in a uh, prosthesis in this case with a long neck. It just shows uh, edema within the neck. We're seeing a, a lot of these. Uh, now, th th this is uh, one of the, uh, this was the patient that we saw very early on actually in Santa Barbara. So we'll. Fa we'll uh, uh, this is an elderly patient came into the hospital and it was for a rule out hip fracture. And okay, um, is it just uh, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, so great cut off, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so right hip. I kind of like to window it a little bit. I don't really see much. A few feebleness, some soft tissue edema. Yeah. Uh, is there some an irregular hyperlucency extending to? I I really. Here's the polytone. Yeah. I I, I, I thought maybe there might be some irregularity here. Yeah. Hard to tell. This, these were red as negative. Okay, that's and, fine. Uh, day two, the hospitalization patient had persistent pain. Uh, and and really the, the doctor said, you don't have a fracture, you need to get up and walk. Oh. So they tried to do rehab, and the patient complained and just refused to follow the doctor's advice. So they decided to do a CT scan. Uh, this is just a, a uh, one of them. Obviously, many uh, CT images through almost whole CT scan. Okay. Um, this is right through the area of concern. Okay. I mean, 
think there's some disruption of the trabecular pattern here that I don't really see. A, I don't really see much, honestly. Certainly the cortex looks intact. Yeah, right? the cortex does. Okay, then we had day three. The patient continued to be cheers in spite of everything. So they talked us over across the street in the MR scanner. So we convinced them to come over and do an MR scan. And this is what it looked like. Oh, wow. And get closer to the mic, please. Um, so, on the, is that the left side? The left side of the brain. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a completely displaced fracture. So, the, the situation here is in between probably the CT and the MR scan, the patient completed the fracture and they got a displaced fracture. So unfortunately, we didn't get the MR earlier, and in those days, we did not have PD fat set images. In fact, they had just come out with stir images at this particular time. <clears throat> uh, but but, but uh, what we could see with the MR scan was a displaced fracture, and obviously, you'd be able to see this with both the plain film and the CT at that particular time. And then we got interested, and we then we went on and did the other studies where we started looking, and we found that we could detect the trabecular edema pattern much earlier than you could with uh, bone scan, CT, or plain films uh, later on, and uh, recommended that everybody actually switch to using MR scan to evaluate uh, hip injuries early on. So that's kind of a little history there. Uh, this this um, event occurred after after the CTs. Yes. Uh, it's pretty, pretty obvious that they did, did this before uh, they, as I remember, then they tried to push physical therapy on this patient. Yes. In fact, the patient went to physical therapy twice. But yeah, that, that there is the, the, the big mistake. The, the, the patient was non-cooperative. Well, the patient is probably dehydrated and uh, the, those were the days. Yeah. Say, Jennifer, this patient came in with right hip pain. Um, it looks like there might be some focal marrow edema along the right superior femoral head and neck junction. I can't tell if that's real. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Let's look at some of the other images. Here's, okay. here's some other images of this patient. Okay, so here there's edema in the right sacral ala concerning for a sacral insufficiency fracture. And yes. most of the sacral insufficiency fractures that I've seen, at least in the early days when we're doing studying this, uh, the patients actually presented with hip pain rather than back pain. So just remember, we're seeing a lot of different kinds of injury patterns here, but uh, uh, when somebody comes in with hip pain, especially an older individual who is uh, osteoporotic, uh, you, you have to make sure you evaluate the sacroiliac joints, uh, the sacrum, and the entire pelvic ring, because uh, pelvic ring fractures are also, as you saw in that study that we had, 23% of the patients who came in actually had pelvic ring fractures rather than uh, what we call just a regular hip fracture. So you have to make sure you you look at the entire pelvis in these particular patients. Uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, somebody gets a hip fracture. Where where you where do you expect the pain to be? Mm, usually, I thought they have pain in the inguinal region or even radiating down the leg. Uh, inguinal is is the most common, and then there's a lateral, then there's posterior, and then there's sometimes in the knee. Uh, they say it's rare in the knee, but I don't think it's rare. I think it's more common than rare. Uh, those are the places where you usually see the pain. Thank you. Five-year-old postpartum female with right hip pain. But, but don't forget, you can get pain in the back too. Okay. So looking at the right femur, I see a kind of some linear 
increased stir signal. I don't know if that's real. Yeah, right, going through there. Um, and now you're showing us the sacrum is markedly uh, increased stir signal throughout the right sacral ala concerning for a, a fracture. And this is from. Uh, so, so why don't we stop here and we'll pick up and look at some other uh, traumatic injuries around the hip tomorrow. Okay. okay. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And have a nice afternoon. Don't blow away. All right. Right. Thanks. Tie yourself to a tree. Good idea.